Hello. Uh, I was asked to give a, a short introduction into Oyster and La Bianca. Um, it was 1990, 1990 when I first read this name, this really strange name, because it has two parts. La Bianca, that sounds a little bit uh, Spanish or Italian, I don't know. And the other one is Norwegian, with this damaged first letter, the first damaged O, which is not shown here, but uh, that was really impressive for somebody in Germany that uh, one, a person with these two different parts of name uh, writes a book. And uh, I also was uh, really admired this book uh, called Sedentarization and Nomadization, Food System Cycles at Hespan and Vicinity in Transjordan. Uh, this was for me a very impressive book because it and an eye opener because I learned a lot of things which I never heard before. I was trained as a theologian and as an archaeologist, but that was a completely new field, and I learned a lot of your book. And I think it's still maybe the best or one of the best books in this uh, topic uh, generally. So Oyster was uh, born in Norway, and he traveled around a lot in his early years. So he studied in Austria, then in Beirut, then in France, and then he came to the United States uh, to do PhD in Andrews University, then MA in Loma Linda University, then he studied in Harvard, then uh, PhD in Brandeis University, and since 1980 he is professor uh, for anthropology in uh, Andrews University, and uh, still those years, or a little bit earlier, he works in um, uh, Tel Hispan, and he still works in the region in the Madiba Plains project. Uh, 40 years of permanent work on the same area, that's really uh, astonishing, so I always decided to uh, have a new place where, uh, where I could uh, excavate, but uh, yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Wolfgang. Uh, actually, you did me a great uh, service by pointing out that I have worked a very long time in one place, and that is going to be reflected in the topic that I will address today. Because one of the advantages of having worked or working for a very long time in one place is you keep coming back and asking, what does it all mean that you've been digging up for all these years? And so for sure, that is really uh, why we're here. And uh, uh, my colleague, uh, Terry Stordal, and I are really honored to have so many of you from Jerusalem and the area around here come and listen to two of us Norwegians talking about your land. We have given a lot of thought to uh, this presentation and we look forward to your reactions to what we have to say because actually our project has been about trying to really understand what it is about this land that is special in some important ways. But I think perhaps in ways that uh, may not be quite what you have anticipated, we will see. Uh, before I get into uh, actually doing the presentation, I would like to first introduce the other members of this workshop. This is a workshop, and it's my workshop, so I have selected some people to be a part of it, starting with uh, inviting my colleague to come down and to be a part of it, Dr. Terry Stordalen. I'm just going to enter in here, hit the name, so I can get up my notes. And uh, let me briefly first give a brief introduction to Dr. Stuart Allen. Just have to take a moment here. Okay, so first I want to say thank you to Matt Adams, who is, of course, the director of Albright and who did a wonderful job leading us on a tour of Egypt. We've just come back. And um, though I had been to Egypt before, it was a stunning experience, what we had uh, and, and, and the way the tour was led. A great group of travelers as well. So it was an extraordinary tour. Thank you so much, Matt, for your leadership in that. Also, thank you to Sarah Fairman, who has announced these meetings and helped with the promotion of it. And then to Aaron Greener, who is uh, in charge of organizing these programs. I want to thank him. And of course, Hisham Mfara, the chef, who always provides such wonderful repast for these events. 
Now, Terry Stordahl holds a Doctor of Theology degree from the MF School of Theology in Oslo and now serves as a professor of Hebrew Bible and Old Testament studies uh, at the University of Oslo. He is also a visiting professor of social science at Aalborg University, Denmark, and he is, a visit he is visiting Jerusalem this week with his partner, Marianne Holgor, a professor of law at Aalborg University. Professor Stordalen has had a number of longer and shorter visiting appointments, including at the Lutheran Theological Seminary uh, in Hong Kong, in Peking University at, in China, and at the Georg August Universität Göttingen and Lund University in Sweden. As head of the former research network Religion and Pluralist Societies, Professor Stordalen conducted and headed extensive cross-disciplinary research there. He is also the leader of the research group Local Dynamics of Globalization in the pre-modern Levant, which was situated at the Center for Advanced Study of the Norwegian Academy of Sciences and Letters between 2014 and 2015. And Professor Stordal has also taken part in excavations at Tal Hespan. Then when he is finished, uh, I have invited uh, Professor Anne Killebrew to be a respondent. In, uh, we've known her for many years, but as some of you may know, she's an editor of a fine book on the Levant, and we're going to be talking about the Levant, so she really had no excuse not to say yes to me. <laughs> now, Professor uh, Killebrew is Associate Professor of Classics and Ancient Mediterranean Studies, Jewish Studies, and Anthropology at Penn State University. This semester, she is one of the two annual professors here at the Albright. She holds a PhD from Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Uh, Professor Killebrew has conducted fieldwork for the past 35 years in Israel, Turkey, and Egypt. Her research interest includes the Bronze and Iron Ages in the Eastern Mediterranean, ancient ceramic studies, Roman and Byzantine Palestine, new technologies and 3D documentation in archaeology, and heritage studies, public archaeology. She has participated or directed the archaeological project at numerous sites in Israel, including Jericho, Deir al Bala, uh, uh, Tel Mikne, Ekron, Tel Bethshan, Megiddo, Kasrin, and Kesson, as well as six year landscape archaeology survey in Sicil Sicilia, Turkey. She is currently the co director of the Tel Ako Total Archaeology Project, located at the UNESCO World Heritage Site of Ako. She is the co-founder and co-editor of the Journal of Eastern Mediterranean Archaeology and Heritage Studies, a peer-reviewed journal published by Pennsylvania State University Press. And then, delighted also to have here from Bar Ilan University, Professor Aaron Meyer, a professor of archaeology in the Department of Land of Israel Studies at Bar Ilan, and director of the Tel Esafi Goth Archaeological Project, he earned his PhD in archaeology from the Hebrew University as well. His primary expertise is biblical and ancient Near Eastern archaeology, with a particular focus on the Bronze and Iron Ages of the ancient Near East. He, is, he also has collaborated with many scholars in numerous inter- and multidisciplinary projects, particularly those relating to the application of scientific methods in archaeology, as well as anthropological perspectives in archaeology. He has participated in excavations at numerous sites in Israel, including Hatzor, Jerusalem, Beshan, Kassil, and Tel Yevne. Professor Meyer's publishing output has been prolific, including three sole author volumes, six edited volumes, and over 200 chapters contributed to books or articles in peer-reviewed journals. Delighted that you could be here and also uh, enter in with comment. And then all of you are here too, and we hope that after these two responses, each about 10 minutes, uh, that there will be some responses and questions from the rest of you who are here. And with that, I, uh, we are done with the introductions, and I can go on to begin our presentation. And I need the advance, um, there we are. So the topic of our presentation today is a global turn for the archaeology and history of the Southern Levant. And um, see, uh, do we need to turn something on? Okay. So the, as I've already indicated in the introduction of Dr. Stodalen, this project actually is a continuation or a wrapping up 
of an initiative that was started as part of the Center for Advanced Study of the Norwegian Academy of Sciences and Letters called Local Dynamics and Globalization in the Pre-Modern Levant. I was a, a member of that project, as was Professor Bethany Walker, who I think is going to come in after she's done with her pottery reading. She's also here as, uh, this semester. The, uh, an output of the project will be a book that is, has been approved for publication by Equinox Publishing called Levantine Entanglements, again with the subtitle Local Dynamics of Globalization in a Contested Region. Now, what is this global turn in academe? Well, the, the term is new for most people. They've never heard it, so they're wondering, what is it? And I just wanted to show that I'm, it's not something I've come up with. It's out there. There are books being published, such as there's a book in global studies field called The Global Turn, theories, research, dial, uh, research to science, and so forth. Medieval art history, reassessing the global turn in medieval art. The global turn is also a topic in political science. In fact, uh, one of your colleagues at Olberg has published this book dealing with um, the topic. And of course, uh, this book, The Prospect of Global History, is history's contribution to the turn. And then in the general field of higher education. And you will find this turn starting to happen more and more. But uh, um, this paragraph from uh, uh, the American Historical Review back in 1995 is quite interesting. And it kind of, sort of sets the stage for what this global turn is about. The world we live in has come into its own as an integrated globe, yet it lacks narration and has no history. That seems like a very strong claim, doesn't it? We have a lot of histories, but we have a history of the planet as a whole. The central challenge of a renewed world history at the end of the 20th century is to narrate the world's past in an age of globality. So that's the project that we are attempting to engage. How do we do that? Now, we are not alone in this effort. Uh, in fact, we, owe, we stand on the shoulder of greats. Uh, Fernand Braudel, the uh, leader of the French Annales School, of course, laid the groundwork for much of uh, anticipating global history and the global turn by uh, his great work, The Mediterranean, in two volumes, in which he basically laid out the case for studying the, a whole region, not just from the perspective of civilizations and empires, but looking at the Mediterranean as a whole. And in his case, seeing a unity in the Mediterranean. But then two of his uh, disciples, Peregrine Holden and Nicholas Purcell, the latter member of our project, wrote a really seminal book that came out in 2000 called The Corrupting Sea, in which they actually took issue with Braudel and argued that in fact the Mediterranean region is what it is a region of fragmentation that is overcome by connectivity. A different argument, a different take. But again, these are efforts to understand whole regions as a part of a larger global history project. So what is global history? It studies the accumulative impact and career of humanity on planet Earth and on other living things. It studies the past in deep time and on a planet-wide canvas to overcome Eurocentric, imperial, and nationalist biases. It is transnational and transcivilizational in scope, focusing on connectivities that span oceans and link major world regions. It's a perspective made possible by modern technology, which enables viewing the Earth from space. And I see my project as sitting up there in space and looking at Hespan through time as it has been linked to other, uh, and, and this region and beyond in its history. It's of necessity a multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary undertaking. It is made urgent by human activity overwhelming the natural process of the planet, the Anthropocene. We are in the process of destroying our habitat. And so we need a history of this story in order to know the way forward. And so it offers a deep time perspective on questions of sustainable future for planet Earth and humanity. We, as humanity, as historians, can and do have something we can contribute to the discourse about uh, the future of humanity. I should also mention that I uh, was, was editor of a book with Sandra Sham 
connectivity in antiquity in which we kind of anticipated this global turn came out in about 2000 as well. Globalization as a long-term historical process. Now I would like to claim as part of the um, anticipatory story of global turn our own William F. Albright. After all, he wrote a book that was not just about one or two periods in history. It was about trying to understand a really a global phenomena. And so in that sense, he, he anticipated global history with his From the Stone Age to Christianity. Surely we should recognize that very uh, uh, ambitious undertaking uh, of our uh, namesake for the Albright Institute. Now, ultimately, all archaeological sites offer windows on globalization as long-term historical process. And this is just a map showing a whole bunch of archaeological sites throughout the, um, the ancient Near East. And where I have worked, Tal Hespan, and I've actually worked this since, I, since 1971, so going on 50 years. Um, the site spans from late Bronze Age to the present. And you might say, what can you learn after all those years? Well, actually, it's precisely this. It has provided an opportunity to think deeply about what we have found, not merely to describe it, but why is it there? I'm an anthropologist. Anthropologists study the world behind appearances. Why do these things happen that happen in the archaeological record? That's the question that animates my thinking. So we have already published 10 volumes. We have two more, four more that are coming out. And they are all quite traditional in the sense that they address, the, they present the data. The volume that uh, Wolfgang referenced was the first one, which was kind of a break, a, a, a different approach. But nevertheless, it was an attempt to sort of uh, understand Hespan in the long term. I would say what I'm working on now is the bookend to that volume in trying to situate Hespan within a global context. Now, Back in the day, some of you archaeologists, you remember there was a lot of talk about the new archaeology. And I guess I was one of the people that helped to bring the new archaeology to this area. I can assure you of this, that there were nobody saving animal bones like we did at Hespan in 1971. They were being thrown out pretty widely. Uh, they were just beginning to be saved. But we saved everything and produced the first volume and to this date, I believe the only full-length volume on faunal analysis for this region. And I also uh, started paleobotanical uh, sampling in Hespan. But the important thing about these two fields is that they put me in contact with the local, an encounter with the local people that live there today, and opened my eyes to the importance of a different narrative. We, after all, didn't go to Hespan to save animal bones. We went there to look for biblical Hespan. And so it turns out that uh, this particular specialty opened up some new possibilities. And, it, and, and one of the things that happened as I was uh, doing this work with the bones is I didn't fit in. People asked, why are you doing that? What can we learn from all these bones? And that forces you into a position of having to defend and explain. And it was that that led me to uh, a search for a theoretical framework that could justify the work with bones. And of course, it was out there. And this is how I connected to the food systems research approach, which I then adopted and tailored to work with the archaeological record. Food systems studies all of the interrelated activities carried out by people in their quest for food, including how water is obtained, how food is procured, protected, harvested, processed, distributed, stored, preserved, prepared, consumed, disposed, and even the organizational and beliefs behind that. It seeks to understand the managerial requirements of various types of food production strategies and their associated political organizations. It studies long-term cycles of intensification and abatement, and it offers lessons for sustainable development of global and local food systems. Okay, it's strike on strike. Okay, try one more time. There we go. Okay, so from studying some 50,000 bones and also with great help from Joachim Bosnick and Angela von den Reich at the University of uh, Munich at the time, we were able to reconstruct daily life habits. And with an artist 20 years ago, we made an attempt to show what we learned about the changes over time, over 3,000 years in the food production system. So this uh, 
painting shows four basic strategies for producing food. You have up here the field crop production using teams of oxen. And then you have tree crop production, typically involving on slopes, mules, and donkeys. Then sheep and goat production and camel production. So through ethnographic research, it became clear to me that these different types of bones became a window on the kind of agriculture. But then from the seeds, I could see that when I were getting a lot of uh, cattle bone, I was also getting evidence of cereal. When I was getting the mules, I was getting evidence of pits of olives and grapes and so on, I began to put together a picture of change over time in the food system represented by those different colors. Uh, so again, this is an estimate. We are now in the process of creating a 3D that I hope will be a lot more uh, effective in showing these long-term changes in the food system of Hespan. Again, the raw data on which this is based is published in the book uh, Faunal Anal uh, Hespan 13 the faunal remains. But here then is a long-term history of food production in Hespan and the land use patterns as we estimated them at uh, 20 years ago. Now from these estimates I produced what has become kind of an iconic chart for me and one that you see from sites all over Israel these days. They are, they, they are metric, using different metrics. It can be settlement patterns, whatever. But here we go. It's a kind of a boom and bust story of uh, periods of intensification and then abatement, intensification and abatement. And uh, so uh, in my book, Hespan 1, I published this chart and provided documentation for these boom and bust cycles. And today I would modify some of what I said there. But the, 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 I got very good reviews of that book. But there was one common criticism. You don't explain why those cycles are occurring. Well, nobody else was trying to explain it either, but that's been my task ever since. Why are we getting these ups and downs? And that is what I want to come to tonight. Why are we getting these cycles of boom and bust? And I know Israel Finkelstein has shown me nice. He probably had the same cycles where you are. They're all over the place. Why are these cycles happening? That is an interesting question. It's the kind of stuff that animates anthropology. Well, to answer that question, I want to, uh, to introduce, introduce a theoretical framework that I have found quite interesting in that regard, maybe promising, and this is where I want to, I'll be especially interested in the responses that you have living in this region. This is a framework uh, that I'm calling the endemic polycentrism hypothesis. Top-down versus bottom-up approaches to risk management and social order. So sit back a moment, we need to get the theory and then we can go from there. Okay, so there are two basic sort of processes in all so social uh, settings, you could argue. There are those forces that pull together, that's called the centripetal force, that's when things are gathered together, and we saw awesome examples of centripetal power in Egypt. I kept being aghast at what I saw. How could they build such enormous pyramids? And with the centripetal force, you then get a kind of a unicentric system uh, of, a, of political organization with a bureaucracy and a hierarchy. So those words kind of go together. Now, what's the alternative to that hierarchical system? Well, there are opposite forces of centripetal, those that pull apart. And for us, many of us, we think that's automatically a bad thing. It isn't necessarily a bad thing. I don't think we should make a value judgment. But the point is, a centripetal force pulls apart. Polycentrism is the result where you have multiple centers. And there's a word for that. It's called a heterarchy, where you have actually uh, control, in, not in one place, but in several places. And such systems work on the basis more of trust and honor. And you know, the United States was founded on a federalist vision to avoid having a central government. So the federalist system is a polycentric system. Uh, the um, article that uh, sort of set in motion the thinking about uh, centripetal, centrifugal forces was by uh, Richard Hartstone, 1950, in the American Annals Association of American Geographers. Now, uh, so with this framework, we have social order and agency in Egypt and the Southern Levant. Let's compare the two. For the, this is a kind of a, when you theorize, you have to simplify but here is a kind of a 
very simple model of a, what, what a truly unicentral centripetal system can produce, the kind of hierarchy that, that made possible the pyramids. So I would argue in the very simple sense that <coughs> Egypt is a place to look for centripetal forces having been favored, leading to a monocentric system and hierarchy. It involves force and also faith. <laughs> and of course, but in such a system, there's less agency, ability to do things at the local level. The opposite is, I would argue, what we have in our region in the southern Levant. And of course, you have it in Egypt too, but we have more of the opposite here. And that is, the centrifugal forces have been favored here, leading to a more polycentric and heterarchical history involving trust, honor, and greater local level agency. Now with that, I now want to talk about, OK, so this is the contrast. Um, one, of, one of the wonderful things about being able to come for a semester to the Albright is you get to see things you haven't seen before. We've now uh, had a wonderful tour led by Matthew of uh, the, his work in Megiddo. And this is the triple temple in the intermediate Bronze Age there. Comparing, which is an impressive set of uh, uh, foundations, but compare that with the Abu Sir e Egypt at the same, roughly the same time, and you get the sense that there's a lot more centripetal power going on in Egypt than in Palestine. I mean, that's a kind of a no-brainer, right? Now, um, so then I'm now going to identify about six or seven uh, aspects features of the Levant that, con that, that make these centrifugal forces work as they do. And the first, of course, is the um, regional and local, local microecological variants in the southern Levant. As we drove for hours up and down the uh, Nile, and of course you have some variation, but it's still basically the same in terms of the agricultural foundation on which the whole region. So it's much more of a uniform agricultural situation. I do know that crops vary with the heat and so forth. But in our region, we have much greater microecological variance. And even in Hespan, where we work, we have three different regions that people can use. There are the highlands, there's the plains, and there are the slopes going down to the river, to the valley. And people keep taking advantage of the risk management that comes from this different ecological condition. So that's the first thing about our region in general. And as you can see here, as you well know, there's great variability in ecological conditions in our region. Now the second contributing factor to this being a more centrifugal polycentric region is of course that we are a land bridge, a crossroads of civilizations that brings people and empires through the region, new languages, many other things that keep adding and new um, exposure to new things, but also complicating any effort to create a centripetal system. And in Hespan, we have the footprints of Egyptians, Assyrians, Babylonians, and these each were attempts at creating some sort of a centripetal unified kind of a governance, but in fact, they're mostly very faint in their traits at Hespan. We have a pretty good Roman footprint, and we have a fairly decent um, Mamluk footprint, but, uh, and we have others too, I mean, but they're, they're not really persuasive. The fact is, most of the order was kept at a lower level than, than uh, where we are in Hespan, for sure. So again, uh, the, these uh, imperial predations is another factor that has contributed to the, to the polycentrism of our region. And then add to that the birth and flourishing of religious movements in this region, which as we will hear in the lecture from Dr. Stordal, and is directly related, we believe, to the fact that there's polycentricity in this region. It created the space to flourish, and they in turn both involve a certain amount of centripetal and centrifugal interaction. We can discuss that later. But at this point, I'm being sort of ambiguous about that, deliberately. Then, of course, the movement of diverse groups of people in and out of the region. And we see that a great deal in Jordan. I mean, even just the years I worked in Jordan, there was less than a million people there. Today, there are over seven, uh, seven, uh, over seven million. 
anyway, the point is that uh, this movement of people, of course, also contributes to the centrifugal force. And then a very important driver of centrifugal force is the Arabian Desert, which is a reservoir of Bedouin values that involve a, a valuing of autonomy and a certain uh, consensual approach to governance, which keeps feeding into this region. It's not to say it didn't happen in Egypt, but it had, has constantly fed into our region. And then finally, I would mention what I have identified elsewhere as the little traditions. These are way, the community level agency in management of risks in the Levant. They begin with local people knowing where to find water. They don't need Roman aqueducts. They know where the water is. Um, it's about mixed agropastoralism, being able to turn to animals or to cereals as opportunities and threats come along. It's about knowing how to live in a cave, in a house, in a tent in order to facilitate whatever you're doing in food production. It's about having flexible borders that you can expand in and out depending again on risks. And hospitality is not just good manners. It's a way to build up a sense of uh, uh, IOU and being able to also get information. Uh, honor and shame is about a system of social control in the absence of empire and state and na national uh, systems of order and ultimately the tribe is that solidarity that uh, that embrace all of these customs which become means of survival at the local level this is the these are the tribal sentiments that have been at the bedrock of society that have kept the centrifugal forces stronger in this region than elsewhere it's not to say they don't exist elsewhere but they're harder to overcome here. And so the Levant, the Southern Levant, tends toward polycentrism and greater local level agency in management of risks. It is more resistive of centripetal interventions. And so I, how do I account for the cycles of ups and downs that we talked about earlier? Well, to begin with, I would have to say that a very important uh, explanation is to recognize that there are regional differences over time and space in centrifugal force and centrifugal force matters. I think that, in fact, as you go further south in Jordan, the centrifugal forces get stronger. As you get into the, across into the area of Jerusalem and the highlands of, Cain, of, of um, Judea, you might have a bit less of that force. But again, it's an empirical question. But the point is that, that these forces are at work in the region. Now, there are other factors, too, that account for the cycles. And I'm working on that my book here. The impacts of innovations and, and technology and so forth, deepening of entanglements of the region around the world through economic uh, changes, devastations wrought by epidemics and famines, the effects of the great acceleration that has led to the modern world, and of course, it changes in the environment. But in, the point is this, that these are the kinds of factors that I believe have to be taken into account to account for the different cycles that we see here. So in conclusion of my part of the talk, what are the implications of this polycentric hypothesis for the archaeology and history of the Southern Levant? Well, first of all, a shout out to Cy Gitten, because material cult culture does matter. And uh, I, I want to just thank him for his friendship and support in making it possible, being one of those who uh, stood by my effort to become a part of the team here. Uh, the centripetal projects by power-seeking elites are transient and difficult to sustain in the southern Levant. It's the first point. Second point, no pristine imperial states ever arose here, only secondary states. And these, these are states that come kind of in response to primary states. And these much later in the case of the ancient Israel, Ammon, Moab, and Edom. When state-level polities arise, they remain highly influenced by kin-based tribal sentiments and practices, typical of tribal kingdoms. Shlon's House of the Father is a case in point. Monumental architecture takes off much later than in Egypt and on a much more modest scale. Bureaucratization, the creating of bureaucracies under control of elites, 
takes off much later. And early epigraphy does not, as a rule, reflect state-level pers perspectives, unlike Egypt. Hence, the relative paucity of the epigraphic finds from archaeological sites in this region. Elite consumption patterns are also much more modest. And when they appear, they are more often than not represented by imports. And finally, the social space afforded by the polycentric social order of the Southern Levant allowed alternative forms of social power to arise here and to flourish and spread worldwide, as will next be discussed by my colleague, Professor Terry Stordalen. So Terry, you are now on. So it's a go. Well, uh, first of all, thank you very much to the Institute and to Professor LaBianca for the invitation to come here. And to the Institute also for allowing Mariana Holger and myself to stay here at these wonderful premises. Uh, and thank you to all of, the, all of you who showed up today, respondents and participants, for taking the time to attend. I have been very much looking forward to dialogue with you all. Uh, with some fear and awe, I must admit, because I'm in your field now and not mine, but still I'm looking very much forward to what is going on. Uh, so this is my title, the, when top down meets bottom up. As, as you can hear, that dovetails with what uh, Einstein just did. Uh, let's start with this happy fellow over there on the top of the broken column at Tal Hespen. Um, he climbed up there to have his picture taken by me, the Westerner visitor. And later on, it slowly dawned on me that he actually illustrates a feature of cultural production in this area that I missed at first, and I think that many of us actually miss. So he's a sort of icon for the kind of cultural production that we're going to talk about here today. Uh, I have 30 minutes to summarize 20 years or so of research. So it's going to be more like a flyover than a deep drilling uh, session. Hopefully, uh, I will still make some touchdowns that we can uh, discuss later. But to help you, uh, keep, you, uh, to help you keep um, the overview, this is it. This is these seven points I'm going through, and they will reappear so you can see in white print where I'm supposed to be. Uh, Let's start with the Bible as a universal phenomenon, or is it really? Um, some 20 years ago, I was brought to reflect upon the fact that the sequence of books in the Hebrew Bible is different from the one in Western Christian Bibles. The Masoretic collection ends in, in Second Chronicles with a call to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem, while the Protestant Old Testament ends with prophetic pointers to the Messiah. Such differences are conveniently interpreted in the light of the different structures of the Jewish and Christian faiths, respectively. But later on, it dawned on me that what is really significant about these differences is the fact that most people, including most biblical scholars in either camp, usually do not bother with them at all. The two expressions, Hebrew Bible and Old Testament, are effectively perceived to name one and the same collection of scriptures. Indeed, the Bible, even with or without the New Testament, is often seen as a truly universal phenomenon. And yet, when you look into it, there are not only varying sequences of books in different editions of the Tanakh and in different manuscripts, but there are also two very distinct Western Christian Bibles and then a range of Eastern Orthodox Bibles that reflect two or maybe three different Greek originals. Uh, indeed, the version of the Hebrew collection that is now commonly seen as the primary, that is the Protestant Bible, this precise version only emerged as universal during the 19th century as the Scottish and British Bible societies decided that they would follow Calvinist tradition in their printed Bibles. Common everyday and academic parlance seems to have forgotten these insights, wailing them under the cipher of the Bible as one 
universal ancient book. Evidently, however, editions like the Global Study Bible are modernist and colonialist in every sense of the world. They are globally available, but only to that fraction of humanity that is able to read this kind of complex English, this kind of ecclesial vocabulary, and that have the means to acquire a copy. So, and still, biblical texts run across the globe. There is no question about that. So, um, this fact is usually explained by pointing to certain superb uh, qualities. Sorry, where, where are we now? Certain superb qualities uh, about the text itself. Um, usually, it's religious, moral, or literary qualities. However, since the collection is not everywhere the same, and since its religious and moral qualities are interpreted in so many different ways, pointing to biblical literature as such does not explain the global spread and the use of Bibles. So, what are the additional dimensions contributing to the distribution and use of these collections of scriptures? Surprisingly, perhaps, the key to start answering that question seems to lie in the very region that supported the making of these scriptures in the first place. Uh, so we're uh, looking at the global perspe uh, history perspective now. Um, and I'm going to explore some facets of what I then just presented. Um, and this means, uh, first, that uh, I'm no longer see Jewish, Christian, or Islamic scriptures primarily as sources for the respective faiths. Instead, I wish to explore the phenomenon of canonical scriptures used to chart ethnic or group identity, and I'm going to see it as, as a cultural paradigm. As such, they stand out as achievements in the history of human culture, and I'm in the following, I'm not concerned with the ideological contents of the various adaptions of that paradigm, but rather in the cultural anatomies and workings that it displays. Secondly, uh, this very orientation has made me see canonical scriptures as part of larger webs of institutions, practices, and memories, and so forth. Scriptures remain canonical, I'm going to argue, not only because of their content, but because of the complex of practices that keep staging them as superb. And I call these practices canonical ecologies, and we'll return to those below. Finally, um, certain characteristics of cultural production in the pre-modern Levant alerted me to a particular configuration in these canonical ecologies. On the one hand, they make use of very elite cultural products like writing, literature, philosophy. And accordingly, they employ literate elites to curate and control the scriptural collections. But, on the other hand, these scriptural canons only work as ethnic markers if also non-literate users are invested in them. There is a notable impulse, I shall argue, in the literary as well as the social anatomy of these scriptures to secure a space also for the power of readers, a power from below. Like this fellow climbing the pillar. He's not supposed to do it, but when he does, he produces something. I mean, he just appears here again shortly. We're going to return to him. But this power, this power from below, is rooted in local communities' collective understanding of the sense and significance of the scriptures. And in our interpretation, this is one example of how Levantine polycentrism plays specific examples of cultural production. And we're going to see that uh, as I proceed now. So uh, if the answer lies in the region, let us take a very brief look at the Levant. Uh, I'm actually going to give you two words <laughs> to, as a summary. One is fragmentation and the other is exposure. And that's all you need to remember. And you probably know all this already. So I'll try to be very brief. But we, uh, in our project, see the Levant as a unit historically defined by geological and geomorphological conditions. 
It is the arable and pasturable land around the Rift Valley, bounded by a desert in the south and east. East are sharp mountains in the north and the eastern Mediterranean Sea in the west. Um, and, uh, yeah. um, this is a very interesting modern map from the uh, Gulf 2000 project of Columbia University. As you can see in the legend over there, I mean, it's, it's intended to chart ethnic diversity, but in the legend they use mostly religious uh, categories. Uh, very interesting. Uh, but the point is that this fragmentation that we have here, it go, in this region, goes back deep into history. And uh, it is basically, um, it's due to the great differences you have in climate, in soil, and in agriculture in the different mic micro regions, such as the Mishore, the Shefala, the Highlands, the Beka Valley, the plains along Jordan, and so forth. So Levantine fragmentation is based on a geological and geomorphological anatomy, but it was enhanced through millennia of cultural production and local path-dependent development. And this is basically, in our interpretation, what created the polycentrism and the heterarchy that Einstein just talked about. Now, the other is this. You talked about the land bridge. I, I used this concept corridor, but it's the same thing. It's sitting there as uh, a connective link between the epicenters of successive early human civilizations. And it enjoyed, or you might say suffered, uh, cultural exposure, possibly more than any other region in the world. And as I shall show, the combination of polycentrism and massive cultural exposure created a characteristic environment in the Levant. That's basically what there is to say. So let us have a look at the cultural production. The short story runs like this. The Levant documents a mismatch between the amounts of elite cultural products in the region uh, and the lack of elitist power to curate and implement these productions in the ways for which they were first designed. Elite cultural products passed into the hands of local communities and local elites who adapted these products according to local social discourse. And trying to make uh, a long story short, let me just give you two examples. You all know about the seals. I don't need to explain the, the, the elitist position of the seal. But it was used in the Levant in pottery workshops to impress the pottery as part of a branding and perhaps a marketing uh, feature. So the seal now takes on a completely different function. I mean, it's the same technology, <laughs> but the social uh, ramifications are completely changed. Um, and then I will talk a little more about scripts uh, illustrated here by the Gezer calendar. Um, in human history, as you all know, a script uh, first emerged as complex system in Mesopotamia and in Egypt, respectively, and probably a little later in China, equally complex. In these settings, the complexity of writing actually was an advantage. It helped the elite distinguish themselves from common people. And it helped keeping secret what had been written down. Over the centuries, the peripheral Levant was virtually flooded in elite writing. Documents in all kinds of ancient writing systems were read and probably produced by scribes here in the Levant. So these people were not on, only multilingual, they were, <laughs> so to speak, multi-scriptic. However, internally in the Levant, there emerged uh, a much less complicated alphabetic script systems. And one of these systems seems to have allowed for the creation of scribal culture and a nascent ethnic literature before the formation of local states. And that was a literature that did not have state matters as its primary content, like the Gezer calendar here. And this sequence, writing before state formation, is highly unusual in human cultural history. So in synthesis, elite cultural products entered the polycentric Levant without the cultural support and control for which they had been designed. They were implemented and adapted according to local economy, politics, and culture. 
and local communities exercised their power in this process, which allowed for a peculiar mix of elite and popular strategies. For example, Levantine cultures were small and poor, so a local Levantine scribe did not negotiate his products primarily with a league or more centrally located scribes, as would be the case in Mesopotamia or Egypt. Instead, he had to make his profession and his products useful and legitimate to local non-literate patrons and clients. And this is very evident when you've traced the scribes and the scribal products of the Hebrew Bible. So, uh, a few words on canonical uh, ecologies, uh, which I deal with in one of my chapters in the upcoming book that I then talked about. Um, there I track reflections of this up, uh, bottom up, uh, top down uh, mix in the early production and consumption of biblical literature. And in a, in a global history perspective, uh, collections of canonical scriptures would compare to the tip of an iceberg. Invisible, submerged in the unknown, there were innumerable socially sanctioned practices, memories, values, and preferences that kept the tip uh, visible. There were also institutions of use and commentary of public <coughs> deployment, etc. And if it were not for such networks of human activity and their preservation over centuries, canonical scriptures simply would not be recognized as canonical. Or, to put it uh, with a point of statement by Wilfred Cantwell Smith, scripture is basically human activity. And I'll show you a few examples. Um, one of the instances that can uh, be used to illustrate this interaction between superb scriptures and webs of human activity is this medieval Bible, the so-called Biblia con glossa ordinaria. In the little square in the middle up there, um, you have the canonical Vulgate text, the Latin text. And in small print within that square, uh, you have philological explanations for those who are not so well versed in Latin. Uh, the large text, the two columns on the side, um, they are excerpts from biblical commentaries made by patristic authors, have been collected over centuries during the Middle Ages. Uh, and then you have marginal text outside of that again. Uh, and they are standard references for the patristic readers. And in this particular um, example of the Biblia con glossa, uh, in, the, in the bottom uh, panel there, you have the commentary by Nicolaus Lyra. Uh, he was one of the few patristics who knew Hebrew. And this is... This particular document is a Renaissance version of this type of Bible, so they needed to go back also to the sources. So that is why you have Nicholas Lear down there. Um, now the glossa, which is the, my main interest here, um, the main text, it originated in individual books originally by early church fathers like Ambrose and Theodore, Origen, Augustine and others. And it was the ecclesial tradition that collected the most significant paragraphs from these books and arranged them into a running explanation of the meaning of the entire Bible. In this process, the glossa eventually became standardized, or if you like, canonized into this glossa ordinaria, which we have here. And by the Middle Ages, this page with the glossa and all the comments, this is the Pagina Sacra, the sacred page, which then includes the commentary. Um, I see this as a printed echo of social realities of the process. In the middle, associated to the sacred text, you have the canonical community, the ecclesia. Ruling over the interpretation of the text for the ecclesia, there are the bishops and elites associated to the making of the glossa. And then we spot the monks of the learned monasteries who collected and standardized the gloss, added uh, the comments and so forth. And then, of course, we can uh, imagine the illiterate monks who had this Pagina Sacra read to them over the course of two years in a monastery. 
Now, this Christian Bible is not so particular, actually. Here you have the Sonsino Talmud, and it's basically the same. You have the... Well, you're missing the sacred text here. You have Mishnah and then the Talmud commentary to the Mishnah, and then you have the medieval uh, ra rabbinical commentary to that again. But it's the same format. And even it's not limited to these two traditions. It's the same in the Confucian tradition. This is um, a page from the school book of the civil servants. Now, the text in boldface is the original text supposedly written by uh, a student of Confucius. Now, the other is the commentary. Now, this particular commentary was canonized by the emperor. And this is the, what, this is the curriculum that you need to study in the second year to become a civil servant in imperial China. So you have the same system and, and you also have the same social institutions who make the system. So um, it is a, we're looking at a fairly universal phenomenon here. And then I started asking, well, where, where does it come from in the history of the text that, that I'm studying? Um, Right, I just, to round this up, uh, my definition of a canon is that it's not simply a collection of scripture. It doesn't make sense to talk about canon as the scriptural collection only. It is that collection as codified and curated in the canonical institutions and is used, perceived, and venerated in the, in the canonical community. And both the last and the middle part of that definition is necessary in order for something to, to become and to remain canonical. Um, so let's look at the ancient Hebrew version of that cultural paradigm. And I should say, and I'll just give you this, de this definition, what do I mean by cultural paradigm? Uh, in this particular case, the strategy to state collections of professedly superb writings as a charter for group or ethnic community identity. So it, could, it, it does apply to much more than the Hebrew Bible, as you can hear, but, but I have the global history perspective, of course, so I'm looking for the general here. Now, if you look at, i just give you a very brief excerpt here, but this is, these are some of the canons in this sense that we have in the second millennium before the common era. You have, of course, uh, Babylonian epics, myths and hymns, and the Babylonian canon is well known. Same with the Book of Dead and the pyramid texts in, in, in Egypt. I would argue that Ugaritic mythology probably, uh, what we have is written reflections, but there was a, a collection of probably oral mythology that went into what we have from Ugarit here. So you had a number of these, these examples of applications of that strategy. They're all uh, part of ethnic identity or group identity projects. You go to the first millennium before the common era, you can add on Homer and then the philosophers. You can add on the early Hebrew Bible. You can add on Enochic literature, which seems to have been a canon by, it all, by its own and you can add on the Septuagint, which when you apply the um, definition that I have, clearly is distinct from the Tanakh, and in, to my mind, it makes no sense to use the Septuagint to find out what the Tanakh originally looks like, or the other way around. They sit completely differently in society, these two collections. Um, and then it went on in the first uh, century of the, uh, in the first millennium of the Common Era, you have the Glossa Ordinaria that I looked at here. You have the Pshita, which has its own canonical history. You have, of course, the New Testament, the Talmud, and, and before that, the Mishnah. You have the Avesta, and then by the end of the millennium, you also get the Quran. And even closer to the, to the end of that millennium, you get what we call the Hebrew Bible, namely the Masoretic Bible, which, which only emerges at the end of this phase. And I could go on in the second millennium, you have... Uh, um, like the Sikh Guru Granth Sahib, you have uh, the Mor Book of Mormon and so forth. So it goes on and it goes on and this paradigm just keeps producing new examples. 
So um, the key question when I, when I realized all this, um, the really decisive question about the collection that became the early Hebrew scriptures and eventually the Masoretic Bible would be this. How was it possible in a functionally illiterate culture to stage a collection of writings as a charter for ethnic uh, identity? If most people didn't write how did, uh, or read, how did that work? That is the question uh, I'm trying to address here. Um, there you have the question. Uh, as seen about, we cannot think about the ancient Hebrew canon simply as a collection of scripture. We must think about it as a canonical ecology. And the canonical institutions and practices that rendered these scriptures to be an ethnic charter must have been based in an oral world and in local community practices. So within the polycentric Levant, there developed a canonical ecology which features spaces for illiterate members of the canonical community to be doing the canon in ways that were meaningful for them. It was um, not very dissimilar from the local adaption of the roll seal, as we saw above. Secondly, and corresponding with the canonical additions of the Mishnah and then the Talmud, this space for doing the canon was apparently primarily one of moral and ritual conduct. Even the most scripturally oriented voices of the Hebrew Bible, namely the so-called Deuteronomistic voices, are intensely aware that doing the canon means not reading it, but hearing and obeying. That is the format of the Deuteronomistic canonical teaching. Um, the structure of the canonical ecology opens a characteristic space of action then for the end user of the canon. The canon doesn't work unless people choose to follow the commandments. Interestingly, Seth Sanders found that in the pre-state inscriptions of the Southern Levant, there emerges a you that is being defined through being addressed by the inscriptions. Something similar seems to be to occur in early biblical Hebrew literature. There is an addressed you which is supposed to obey and this supposition logically presumes the presence of the opposite option, not to obey. In other words, there is a space, in fact, a need for the user to accept, reform or discard the practices that confirm canonical authority. And to my mind, uh, all this mirrors the fact that the early Hebrew canonical ecology was produced in a polycentric environment. As a result, the Levantine canonical paradigm came to feature a characteristic interplay of top-down and bottom-up forces. And what does he do, this fellow, when he climbs, suddenly climbs up to that pillar, standing there at all his pan? I mean, apart from the fact that he was able to do it, I mean, you can see the height of it. Um, so he had done it before, evidently. But what he does, uh, he knows about Byzantine culture. Uh, he brings to his Arab environment a sort of Western set of dressing. He's very well aware of the mindset of the visiting professor, and he plays it all into that. So this is a very typical local agency at that situation, a kind of cultural production, taking what you can take from the elites and leaving them to believe that they still know what is going on. So uh, this, is, I think, is the key to the unusual cultural resilience of this paradigm. I think that the opening in the, I should say, originally Hebrew paradigm of scriptural canons the opening towards the end user, the opening towards commitment, of course made a lot of owners, stakeholders to these scriptures. And they, the stakeholders are not, they don't agree on anything, but they're all united in the fact of being stakeholders, which kept the canon alive in a very resilient way. Now, um, apparently this feature was salient for the success of the canonical paradigm 
And all the subsequent ecologies that were feeding off these early examples retained this call for the popular engagement. And this made them useful as political instrument, but it also made them potentially unruly and unstable. There is always an opening for a Martin Luther or even a Martin Luther King uh, to emerge and convince his peer readers that the canon should in fact be read differently. And if successful, these rebels readers may sometimes be able to command the centuries of production of authority that have been invested into the canonical ecologies. And I think, as you can see in this picture, it is going on all the time around us. And if you really want to contribute to the understanding of the Bible today, this is something that we need to know. Thank you very much for your patience. First, I would like to thank Sten LaBianca for kindly inviting me to participate as a respondent in this workshop entitled A Global Turn for the Archaeology and History of the Southern Levant and its Implications for Understanding Interactions Between Local, Bottom-Up, and Translocal, Top-Down Forces in Shaping the Levantine Historical Record. I also thank him for forwarding to me several of his essays on Levantine entanglements that address the local dynamics of globalization in a contested region. Uh, Stan and Terrier's presentations raised several very relevant and timely questions regarding our responsibilities as archaeologists, historians, and theologians. Stan has rightly pointed out in a recent lecture at, in Rome, no, in Florence, yeah. Florence um, for the archaeological conference on Jordan, that our focus should not only be on interpreting ancient material culture, written records, and spiritual canons, but also our obligations to the various communities and shareholders we work with, both local and global, requiring what STEM terms a global turn in our approach to the past. Today, globally, we are facing many daunting challenges to our future, including rapid technological, environmental, economic, and political disruptions often precursors of societal collapse, a phenomenon that is very well documented in the archaeological and historical records. In my response, I will focus mainly on the themes of Levantine entanglements that form a key component of Stan and Terrier's most recent research and their new book that's coming out, including um, Levantine responses to societal collapse. Entanglement is not a new concept. Rather it, originated, rather, it originally was a convenient term to understand phenomena that defied the logic of predictable interactions. As appropriated by our anthropologists, for example, Ian Hodder, the term entanglements has been used to define the ways in which humans relate or interact with, with things, which leads to a mutual interdependency. This may well describe the modern condition of, the human, of human entanglement. However, perhaps influenced by a recent trip to Egypt, where the past, in the past things are inevitably intertwined with and defined by environment, natural life cycles, and ideology, I would prefer to see the pre-modern entanglements a concept to describe the interaction between, the human, between humans, the natural environment, and ideologies that produce the things which are symbolic expressions of this relationship. Thus, understand, uh, this understanding of entanglement would highlight the importance of a much closer spiritual connection to natural forces more powerful than humans and a given society's understanding of these forces and one that is influenced by local and translocal conditions. As discussed by Stan, Terrier, and many others, the Levant has been described as a fractured mosaic defined by its specific geography that encourages regional fragmentation and, hybrid, and cultural hybridity, or trend, uh, centrifugal or polycentric trends. In the past, I have termed this phenomenon Levantinism to describe the Levant's richly stratified historical and cultural past, defined for its predilection for cultural fragmentation, resulting in multi-layered identities of its inhabitants. 
Two of the characteristics that, in my opinion, define this unique environment and its resulting cultural production are, one, its local, bottom-up resistance to translocal, top-down power, and its local, bottom-up resilience to translocal or global collapse. The Levant, in particular, has been resistant to long-lasting, top-down global, global forces. In fact, if it wasn't for the written sources, there are often very few re re material remains of imperial domination over this area, except for destruction layers. Even New Kingdom Egypt, that exerted imperial control over Canaan for centuries during much the late Bronze Age, and even attempted to establish a strong physical presence during the twilight of New Kingdom Egyptian imperial ambitions, disappeared completely from the Levant following its retreat and demise. New Kingdom Egypt left no real lasting impact on the material culture of the region except for the memory of enslavement in Egypt as expressed in the Exodus story. With the exception of devastation, the Assyrian and Persian attempts at global domination of the Levant also left very few long lasting uh, remains or imprint on the material culture of the region. Rather, what we see in the material culture of the long durée is remarkable continuity, often defined by local nuances or regional nuances. The second tendency that develops from local, the local Levantine contents is resilience, and this ties into the cycles that you were talking about earlier. This is best illustrated by its resilience in the light of technological and environmental disruptions that occurred, for example, during the final decades of the Late Bronze and Early Iron Ages, which in other regions resulted in societal collapse or decline. Most vulnerable were the global superpowers of the period, most notably the Hittites and the Egyptians. In this case, bottom-up forces proved to be more resilient to collapse. In the Levant, including Cyprus, more localized societies weathered the collapse and, some, and in some cases even flourished following the withdrawal of imperial oversight and exploitation. And as noted by the two presenters in this workshop, the uniqueness of the Levantine context enabled not only the formation of group identities, but also intense cultural production, which we just heard about quite a bit. Technological, environmental, and political disrupt disruptions are not new. Past societies have been forced to deal with equally daunting human situations that we face today. Perhaps the lessons learned from the Levant and its ability to weather the collapse of the world's first global economy may prov provide insights into ways of dealing with the challenges we are facing today. Thanks. Okay, um, well, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me to respond. Um, and uh, first of all, I'm relieved um, that I have something to say. Um, uh, in fact, yeah, last night I wrote an email to uh, Anne saying, what do I do? <laughs> um, but um, in fact, I think I have too much to say, so I'll try to limit. Uh, um, and um, uh, I'll just, I, I didn't write it out, so I'll try to um, talk about uh, several points that I made before and during. Um, first of all, I, I like very much the, um, the attempt to see on the local level and how it affects you know, the top down and the, and the bottom up. Um, and I think that's something that um, um, more and more is being written about recently. I've written a lot this about recently about in the context of the Iron Age of that we have, um, it's, very, it's very convenient to lump things together both on the ethnic level and on the kingdom level um, because it's easy to write a chapter in a book about it. Um, and, but the reality is um, the kingdom of Israel of Judah and Moab and Edom were really just groups of uh, um, a patrimonial kingdom, so, so sort of sort, and they divided up into small groups. And the same thing goes for all the very convenient um, group definitions, which are almost always ethnic, while there's so many other um, uh, identities that are around there, and we're forgetting them. Um, and I think um, I think that's a very important uh, focus. And I th I think the um, 
you use the term, the global term. Now, nowadays, I mean, the last 20, 30 years, if you don't use turn and, and attach to a text, uh, to something, so it's, you're not, you're not uh, showing something interesting. So I think also what fits in very well with your global term, the ontological term of trying to um, um, question the very definitions that we use for making differentiations. And I think that's an, an important uh, thing. Um, and I think another aspect which, is, which might be very uh, helpful here is moving this also into the biological sphere. Because if you look at the Levant, and you spoke about the Levant as a bridge, the Levant is first and foremost a biological bridge um, yes. and a, a very fragmented um, uh, biodiversity um, throughout the Levant, which I think is the basis on which the very fragmented cultural identities come through. Uh, so I think that's a, um, an, an additional uh, thing to talk about. Um, another thing is I think the importance of global synthesis I think is, cannot be um, overstressed. Um, in recent years, we've had several global syntheses, which I think are excellent. Everybody uh, harangues them, for instance, Yuval Noah Harari, Jared Diamond, et cetera, et cetera. I think they're the greatest thing in the world. They may be wrong completely, but they're the, the greatest thing in the world because it gives us, it gives us all perspective of, of who we are. And I recent, um, in the last few years, I had a, a very interesting um, experience when I, I started I decided I have to give uh, archaeology uh, courses in archaeology which deal on a global level because particularly in Israel, we all are taught archaeology of the Levant, of the Iron Age, of the Late Bronze Age, of the Byzantine period, etc. But we more or less deal with a very, very specific thing. And teaching um, archaeology of the world, um, you could see that it opened up perspectives for students, even for the very aspect of that we all are humans from from the uh, uh, Patagonia to Siberia, we're all the same. And it's something that's, uh, that's uh, um, important. Um, I think I'll uh, skip over that. Now, um, as far as the Bible, um, um, uh, I think that perhaps the reason why the Bible has so many versions and it's used so many places, it's because it started out as, it started out as a text of a marginal society. Um, which could be used as a symbol of, of marginality, even by people who are not marginal anymore. You know, you could still be crusaders and use the Bible uh, to explain how, um, how, you know, how you're an underdog. Um, and if you can see this um, anywhere in the world. Um, I, um, I'm, uh, I had a very, very vivid experience of this in, in, in Papua New Guinea, where the people there who I was in contact with were people who were um, Christians, very Bible-oriented, but we're trying to be out of the box by taking on Jewish customs in the middle of nowhere. Um, so it's, it's, it's the being able to use the various versions of the Bible and Bible-related texts in a, um, in a uh, I would say, in whatever way it fits for you. I, yeah, and, and, that's the, and that's the beauty. You can take it and appropriate it in any way you want it. Um, and... and, and and I think the, um, for example, you talk about, you, you brought, uh, uh, brought the example of the annotated biblical text and the annotated Talmudic text. Um, that's, in fact, um, such a complex, multi-layered, I mean, for example, the, 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 the Babylonian Talmud, um, until um, the Jewish commentator Rashi wrote, wrote the interpret uh, 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 an interpretation of it, was basically an un incomprehensible text. And um, Talmudic scholars know today that basically the Talmud is an incomprehensible text. And Rashi used his genius to sort of combine texts that don't make sense into things. So what we're looking at as a, uh, as a uh, as canonical text is really a mishmash, which is at some point was canonized. Um, and I think the same thing goes for all these various texts. And I think the same thing goes for um, um, Islam and, you know, uh, while Traditional Islam look at, it, there's no textual um, criticism in, the, in Islam. Um, they, I think um, uh, Gilner talked about the, that Islam is really um, the canonical text and the local version coming out uh, in every place where it, where it, uh, where it appears. Um, and um, I think, you know, that's, that's a very strong uh, aspect uh, in it. And... Um, 
what else did I want to say? Um, okay, I think I, uh, I made enough points. Okay, thank you. Uh, we, we will take uh, five minutes for questions and comments from the audience, and then we will end because we've been at this for one and well, close to one and a half hours. So thank you, first of all, both of you, for your responses. Um, you were very affirming. We, we would like to hear some hard criticism. <laughs> so you can also, over a glass of wine or beer or water or whatever, if you have criticism, please use the microphone so we can get it on tape. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And maybe I'll start, if you don't mind. Yes, please. Not criticism, but just a challenge. Yes. Um, you know, in physics, we talk about the difference between quantum theory and, and yes. uh, the standard theory. Do you see a problem emerging between interpretations at a local, archaeological, basic, historical level that we're all used to doing and transforming that into a global history or a world history? Boy, that's a great observation and question. <clears throat> well, you know, that's what I'm working on in your library here every day now, <laughs> trying to answer that question. I'm having the luxury of being thinking about one site for nearly 50 years. I'm trying to build that bridge between theory and actual engaging the data. In my presentation, I didn't present much from Hespan, but I could have pulled in a ton of stuff. <laughs> But uh, I, uh, the, the book that I'm producing here will not be a standard site report. It will definitely have chapters that connect with very current issues so that someone who's a policymaker could read my chapter on the food system of Hespan and get something quite relevant. They could read my chapter on um, the social order of the Levant and get something relevant for their work in policy. So I guess I'm quite committed to uh, to archaeology, anthropology, engaging the current crisis facing humanity. And I am a fan of Yuval Noah Harari, I have to say. I think it's an extraordinary thing to have a historian being heard at Davos, at Google, at all these places. Uh, many of us are struggling to justify, I mean, to keep our departments and students relevant. We need to show the relevance of what we are doing. And to me, the big, big takeaway from the Levant is that this is a place uh, the, uh, where, where polycentrism has, in, in a way, worked. And uh, there, there were three slides I threw out because I knew I wouldn't have time for it, but there's a book that's just come out. It's about the importance of a polycentric approach to dealing with the climate uh, catastrophe issue. Uh, and, and, and so uh, we, can we can bring something from our experience in this region. The European model has tended to be hierarchical, but we need to realize that do we really want a uniform hierarchical world order? Can we perhaps imagine a future that is polycentric, which is the very gift of the Levant. It has always been polycentric. Yes, it's been troubled, but it has also survived in a remarkable way through that polycentricity. Long answer to your question. But I, I, I thank you for it, because that is the, the bridge I'm trying to build. Yes, Norma. Thank you, Sue. Yes, thank you so much. Um, I just, there was just one thing that came into my mind. Yes. You, you said, um, that they knew where to find water. Yes, yes. Well, actually, I think it was the opposite in a way, because when you think we've just come back from Egypt, and as Huadot has said, uh, Egypt is the gift of the Nile. Yeah. There was water there. They could have settled anywhere. I'm presuming that the, in majority of places they settled because there was some monument there, and so we have a continuation. But I think in this area, where, as we all know, it's a land bridge, yeah. where we're having continual movement, whether it's, first of all, of animals, of, of fauna, flora, and people. When the people came here, and we have to admit there was always, uh, there was always, there was always, did they know where the water was? No, they had to look for it. And sometimes, I think, in uh, adversity mm -hmm. gives people strength yeah. and innovation. Yeah. And being, having innovation is very, and being an, an, uh, an 
can't even say it, innovative people actually gives you strength and it's very much from the bottom up. Yes. So I think that they didn't necessarily know. Perhaps they, they would look for the water sources, they would sit. Of course, we have tells. Why do we have tells? Of course, as we know, because you could only live where there was water. Yeah. Well, so it, it was the thing of, I think rather they didn't know, you could say they didn't know where the water was because they had to look for the water makes you very innovative. But that, there's a bundle strength. of knowledge that a Bedouin has about their environment that is powerful. And, and they're not going to maintain a Roman aqueduct. But they know where the springs are, when they flow. They have to. They have to. They know where, you know, where the grass will be green and, and where they can look yes. for certain roots. They're remarkable for what they know. And, and that local agency in knowing where water is is part of the resilience strategy that they use. True, and so but, we're looking at a, uh, but if we look at just only at the Bedouin, that's, we're looking at a transhuman society yes. that are doing seasonal, uh, seasonal transhumans. So right. of course they would know where this is when and when, when you move, etc. Yeah. But I'm talking more about the settled or more settled population sure. that are coming to build the cities. Yeah. Did they understand what was there before? And of Th course, these are all things they, which I think we to have learn. to look at to, to understand this whole yeah. global. Um, and there was just one, sorry, just one po other point that I wanted to say. You talk about a literate, an illiterate society. Yeah. Well, actually, I think because you, you have the alphabet, the creation of the alphabet, you had the opportunity for a literate society. I'm not saying everybody was literate, but I think this is very important that your people are able to read. And even if you have a small percentage, that again is coming from the bottom up. Even if it was, we don't know who, there's many theories where the alphabet came from, how it was originated, but it gave that ability. That's what I wanted to say. It was more a literate society rather than for the illiterates. Okay, well, um, basically, let's say I, I agree with what you're saying. We need to talk about literacy in a sort of continuum between the oral world and the literate world. Um, now, the kind of literacy that we know uh, should not be imagined to have existed in the ancient world. <laughs> so that is, that is the basic point that I'm looking at. So, so, so society, for most people, even though they could perhaps read, they didn't in their daily life. They didn't need to because life was governed by oral strategies, uh, I, I would I, presume. I, I think that they... I, uh, not, I, I was rather looking at it, not a question of need, but ability. You could not read if you were reading uh, Akkadian. I mean, how many people could read it, right, cuneiform? But w when you got the alphabet, you had the possibility of people mm -hmm. being able to read. And I think this was the greatest innovation to this whole area sure. from which we get, if we look at the global, whether we're getting Greek, we're coming through to the alphabet of today. So. Sure. Thank you, absolutely. Okay, one more comment, and then we will uh, have our break and uh, our reception. Yes, go ahead. Boy, make it good and make it quick. Yeah. Okay, it was great. Let's go. Um, something for Anne, a question. How much of the concept or the model of resilience, resistance, that you presented very nicely and very briefly, and also the centrifugal, centripetal, mm -hmm. bottom-up, top-down, mm -hmm. which is a very common um, concept when you analyze material culture sure. and certainly change of material culture. I'm talking about pottery, but there are many other uh, data sets. Why is it specific what you presented to the Levant and not, for example, the Hittite, the Neo-Hittite states that also resisted and became resilient and, and resurged after the collapse of the Hittite empire or I don't know, Viviana is an expert on the Inca and the Wanka mm -hmm. civilizations. I'm not knowledgeable enough, but what would make that model, or maybe it's not, you weren't presenting that, why is it more powerful or robust in the Levant? Um, again, the land bridge and the, the ethnic diversity or the cultural diversity and the changes, but I'm wondering if that kind of a model is not legitimate and and holds in it, it can yeah. hold really uh, yeah. what makes it more power why would you use that for the levant perhaps oh, i don't i don't as opposed think to other that places the levant is unique in the world it's just using that model to analyze but i think when you look at the like, like egypt or you look at the hittite empire or you look at um the roman empire for example you just don't la you don't have the 
I would say, in regional, environmental, cultural means to create an empire in the Levant. It's just the natural landscape prevents that type of unification. Even today, you don't have unification in this region. So I think, I'm not saying that the Levant is unique, but I think that these conditions enable the Levant to have, to resist and also be resilient at the same time. And I think a lot of it has to do, if you look at the, uh, the sub-regions, the coastal region versus the highland regions, you're gonna see different models as well. I didn't get into that. But I think a lot of, with the collapse, the coastal regions of the Levant, southeastern Turkey, um, some of the islands, because they're coastal, they were also able to survive and, and actually flourished. If you look in Cyprus, you look at some of the, you know, the Phoenician cities, what became the Phoenician cities. I think it's it's a combination of many factors, but I had a very brief time to present. Yeah, so. <laughs> That's an excellent question that you asked, and of course that is, in a way, what we are, we are making the argument that there's something maybe a little bit special about the Levant. I, I, I would go that far to say that. And, um, it, and, and, and it's the combination of what we talked about. It's not just the factors, I, I mentioned five or six factors that I think explain why we have this centrifugal dynamic going on. But then the, within that space, something happens that creates a space for a very resilient form, of, an alternative resilient form of social order, which is this text-based canonical ecology that eventually ends up providing um, uh, a template for cultural production all over the world. So Easter is being celebrated in China and here and there, but it goes back to, to the template that comes from this region. So what other region can you think of that quite matches the Levant in terms of having uh, spread its influence and being used as a resource for cultural production all over the world? That is what is unique about the Levant, in, in my view. And I know I'm a little bit stronger than this and Dr. Uh, Stuart Allen, but I, I, I think there's something a little special about that particular thing, that, that, that this region produces uh, image templates or paradigms that then become used all over the world. I'm not gonna go into a Marxist approach to that, <laughs> but let's, let's go. Um, Time for <laughs> the break. Thank you very much. Food and drink. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.